So the next section of discussing the chemical senses, we're going to talk about olfaction. So this is our sense of smell. The stimulus for our sense of olfaction is um, our chemicals, and we call them odorants or odor-inducing substances. Uh, these odorants are small molecules that are volatile, so they vaporize easily in the air, and they are hydrophobic, so they are repellent to water. But not all chemicals with these properties produce some kind of smell that we experience. He gives us the example of carbon monoxide. As you know, if you um, breathe this in for too long, it can kill you, and um, even uh, a bit of breathing it in can cause uh, quite a bit of brain damage. And the problem with carbon monoxide is it has no odor, it is, um, but it does have those properties of being volatile and uh, hydrophobic. The olfactory system, like our sense of taste, or our taste system, is a gatekeeper. And in many ways, even more so, um, they're both really gatekeepers, but it keeps us safe because we are, we are taking these um, volatile molecules into our bodies, but not to the same extent as when we are putting food in our mouths and taking that, that, the, that substance into our body. And so the olfactory system is even more of a warning system, and it can tell us that, that we are in a dangerous situation. Uh, for example, so leaking gas or uh, smoke indicating a fire, but it can also just tell us that our food is spoiled and to not eat that food. Um, he, uh, Goldstein distinguishes between macrosmatic animals and microsmatic animals, where macrosmatic animals are the ones who are, um, whose sense of smell is really crucial to their survival, and they have a much keener sense of smell. So it is um, odorants that tell them uh, how to find their food, how to find their mates, and when are there are predators around. Whereas for humans, we are microsmatic. Uh, the sense of smell is much less crucial to our survival, although, as we just saw, it's still this warning system that in specific circumstances, it um, is useful for our survival. It is, a, it is a, one of those senses that we uh, sometimes think that it might be okay to give up the sense of smell, but actually, there are lots of problems with that, and it um, uh, appears to have uh, an effect on uh, things like depression and just having a smaller hippocampi uh, when we lose our sense of smell. Regardless, uh, we are, we, it's not as crucial to our survival as it is for many animals. We are microsmatic and we don't have that same kind of keen sense of smell. And we're gonna see uh, what it is about the systems uh, that make animals have a keener sense of smell as we move forward here. The final thing I want to talk about here of the functions of, of the olfactory system uh, is the possibility that uh, we are influenced by pheromones. So pheromones are chemicals that are uh, secreted, that are released by a member of the species, and then that they influence other members of the species, they influence the behavior of other members. And um, your author talks about this study where uh, Kathleen Stern and Martha McClintock uh, looked at menstrual synchrony. They actually did this study back in the 1970s and then replicated in 1998 when uh, several other labs did not find the same results that they did and then also complained about some of the, um, some of the, way the ways they were looking at they, their statistics. Uh, but they replicated this nonetheless where? What they did was um, they took the underarm secretions of um, donor women, as they were called, and these donor women were either in their follicular stage of their menstrual cycle or the ovulatory stage of their menstrual cycle. Uh, they took these secretions, had them on a cotton ball, and then treated that cotton ball so that um, there was no smell, there was no odor involved. And so what we're looking at is the influence of pheromones. And they went and they um, dabbed that cotton ball right under the nose, so just above the lip and under the nose of recipient women. And they had those women not wash that off for six hours. And what they found was uh, if the donor woman was in her follicular stage of her menstrual cycle, then the recipient woman, her menstrual cycle shortened. And if the donor woman was in her ovulatory stage of her menstrual cycle, the recipient woman's menstrual cycle lengthened. 
So it looks like um, even though our uh, vomeronasal organ, the organ that has those um, receptors that respond to pheromones, humans' uh, vomeronasal organ have do not have those does not have those receptors. It looks like pheromones still can influence our behavior uh, underneath our awareness. Uh, so I'm going to talk about detecting odors next. Uh, one of the, the way we measure detection of odors and um, when we can detect odors is we take a detection threshold. We've looked at absolute threshold, different threshold, uh, difference thresholds. The, which this is another threshold of the detection threshold for odors. Uh, people actually, uh, if we go back in your mind to those uh, psychophysical methods and that one of the problems with uh, the old Fechner way of doing things was that people had um, different motivations and different amounts of certainty uh, and there was just um, there was um, ambiguity in the uncertainty because of, of the system well we have even more it looks like a tendency to uh, really differ in our willingness to say yes I smell something some people they have the slightest hint of a smell yes I smell something other people want to make sure they smell something and we we um we're not very we're not very good at uh just saying I smell something <laughs> so what they did was um what they do to get the detection threshold is a forced choice so they give two um two examples of an odor where actually one of them does not have any odorant on it and the person smells and then they're asked which odor has a stronger smell and um, if they are at the 50% mark right they that we know that that's that chance and they have to be well above they have to be significantly above the 50% mark to for us to say yes they're actually detecting the odor so that's how we get the detection threshold uh, if we look uh, just as a comparative uh, rats are 850 times more sensitive to odors than humans are. Cats are about 14,000 times more sensitive, and dogs or are 300 to 10,000 times more sensitive. It really uh, depends on the, the breed of dog quite a bit. So the most sensitive we can get is one molecule per receptor. We saw this similar kind of thing with uh, vision where one photon of um, light energy influences a photoreceptor. We see this in smell where one molecule influences the firing rate of the olfactory neuron um, or the olfactory receptor. I ask here in my green question, why are humans less sensitive than these other animals? And I am looking for a specific answer in this of, of if this is the most sensitive we can get how are we less sensitive than these other animals? I usually get, just because um, I can't actually ask you all, I'm gonna go back to what past classes have said and done, I usually get some real evolutionary explanations that uh, of course make a lot of sense. And, and again, that kind of idea of it's more crucial to their survival, we have our vision, and so we've lost some of this sensitivity. But what and I am, I don't really like asking these questions necessarily where I'm expecting a certain answer and you almost have to read my mind, but you're not reading my mind, but, <laughs> but that we are less sensitive um, because we have fewer receptor neurons and fewer types of receptor neurons. So there's a spoiler alert. I'm going to give you the answer that I'm looking for. So just again, some comparatives that, that can show why we are less sensitive than these other animals. We have about 10 million olfactory receptor neurons. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you here, you don't have to memorize how many different receptor neurons we, we have um, or how many receptors we have that um, I'm gonna have a slightly different number later. Different places give us different uh, estimates of our numbers of receptors, but we're just going to use that as our basic starting point so that we can make this comparison of dogs have um, 
about somewhere between 125 to 300 million receptors. Cats have twice as many as people. Mice have two decimal seven times as many as people. And just for funsies, we'll go ahead and say that elephants can smell water about 19.2 kilometers away. So I can't smell the water that's on my table right now, but elephants need this ability, right, to find water given their environment. And they can smell water that far away. It is very impressive. Here I have just um, included the table that Goldstein includes that shows um, we have different detection thresholds for different substances. And um, what this is showing is how many parts per billion when this substance is mixed with, with something else, how many parts per billion do we need for us to be able to detect that odorant. And so the really low, the T-butyl mercaptan, at a zero decimal three parts per billion, uh, that has a really strong. That's a really strong odorant. This is what we add to natural gas so that it has a smell or an odor for us. Uh, if we look up at something like uh, methyl alcohol or methanol, 141,000 parts per billion. That's a much much weaker um, kind of odorant. Acetone is what they uh, is the main ingredient in nail polish. So while that is seems if you're like me that is a very strong odorant it's actually not very strong in comparison to um, other odorants so this is just a nice uh, table with some examples my last bit about detecting odors and how we are um, uh, getting these measures of thresholds they've also taken different thresholds uh, William Kane back in 1977 using cotton balls found a difference threshold so how many how much different do two odorants have to does do two measures of an of a particular odorant have to be for us to say yes there's a difference he found that difference threshold to be 19 percent but uh, he decided and um, concluded that there were differences in airflow and that there was lots of kind of what we might call situation noise in using uh, cotton balls to do this and so he uh, came up with this olfactometer. Uh, so this, you can see where they are precisely controlling the amount of air and the amount of humidity and the amount of the odorant. And they are um, putting the um, other end of the olfactometer up into the person's uh, nostril. And so we, we are taking out a lot of that situation noise. Using the olfactometer, that threshold dropped to just 11%. The next important aspect of the olfactory system um, to discuss is how we identify odors. So our recognition threshold, uh, what, how much of an odorant that we need in order to recognize what the odorant is, we need a concentration of, the, of what we have for the detection threshold. We need that to be increased by as much as a factor of three in order to be able to recognize the odorant. Um, humans can detect as many as one trillion different odors. At least that is um, one estimate. Obviously, we've never tested people on a trillion different odors, but that is one estimate from um, one of the uh, research studies. Recognizing those odorants is more difficult. And it appears to be that it's the memory for the odorant name that is the problem. And so um, one of the things I do after discussing the olfactory system, uh, usually after, but sometimes a little bit during, is to have uh, another class demonstration. And again, I'm gonna really strongly encourage you to, to do this with someone else, to uh, get a friend, a family member, whoever you're staying with right now, um, staying safe and, and socially distant from, from people, but get a friend or family member and have them choose maybe three or four different odorants and you choose maybe three or four different odorants so you can go around your kitchen i usually go around the kitchen and i actually have um i think i have eight that are part of a um recognition where i give you choices kind of like a multiple choice of what is this odorant and i'm just going to give one example of i usually choose whatever kind of citrus i have in my refrigerator and then i give the uh, choices of like uh, lemon, orange, lime, or 
mango or some other non or maybe grapefruit, maybe another citrusy thing. But so, uh, and then have people say whether or not they recognize them based on more this um, recognition ability versus recall ability, where I have another eight odorants that I chop up or use spices or whatever, uh, and I have them th these little tubes, and I suggest strongly, again, so if you're doing this with a friend, three or four is probably sufficient for looking at the question, at least thinking about the question a little bit. And I'm going to keep coming back to this. So just remember this in the in the next uh, lecture that um, so what I did was um, I have them in the little uh, plastic um, tubes so that it's and I suggest strongly that people don't use their vision because that's that's cheating. You really want to use your olfactory system only. So again, you might blindfold your friend or just suggest they close their eyes when they, so they're not using their vision when they're smelling these things. So I have eight with this more uh, recognition memory and then eight uh, different odorants where I use recall memory. And what I find every semester is that uh, sometimes people aren't so great with the recognition. Uh, people are usually worse with the recall, and that is coming up with the odor, the name of the odorant. Uh, what we're going to talk about as we get into the higher level processing of smell and the olfactory system is that that first primary receiving area is the information does not go through the thalamus, and that primary receiving area is communicating to all of these memory and emotionally associated memory areas and emotional areas and so it's going through a really different route and it's not really that information is not coming back sort of out to the areas of the cortex where we remember things like um, names of, of things it's going into our memory systems and our emotionally associated memory systems in a really different manner and in a much more direct manner but anyway it appears to be the memory for an odor's name that um, is the problem with our ability to recognize odors. Oh, and I, there is one more, so sometimes I can't go back and change. There is one more piece to the olfactory system and this just background, and it is the puzzle of olfactory quality. So um, what we see is uh, really similar molecular structures can create really different perceptions of odor. Uh, he gives us this example to the left of um, in A of musk versus no odor, and you can see that there's very little that's different in those molecular structures. Again, I'm not a chemistry person, so I'm not gonna pull, pull it all apart, but you can just see that they are very similar, and yet musk is a really different smell than having no odor. We also have really different molecular structures where we are perceiving and experiencing a really similar odor. So if you look over in B uh, to the left, we have these two different molecules that are extremely different from one another in their molecular structure, and yet they both smell kind of like pineapple, and so they have a similar odor. And I have a green question here. I do suggest, again, that you pause these for just a moment and think about before you get the spoiler, I'm going to answer you because I'm the only one here. But how, how is this different than vision and hearing? I usually get some real questioning looks from students and um, eventually someone someone usually gets to this. And I can't I can't even think of a lot of the different answers that I've gotten for this. But if you look at what's happening with vision. We have the electromagnetic spectrum, and things that are close on the electromagnetic spectrum are similar in their uh, in the perception of the of the color, right? So if we're up at about uh, 650 nanometers, we're going to see red, and then as we move down to 600 maybe nanometers, where it's going to start to look orange, and as we get down to um, uh, actually, five, 550 or so gets to green, so uh, maybe 590, 580, we're getting to yellow. These are all approximates in my, in my mind, so I'm looking at this in my head. But so, and then we move down to green. So as we are close to each other in what's out in the environment, the physics, we are 
close to each other in perception. And same with hearing, right? If we're looking at the frequencies and the different pitches, as those frequencies are um, 1200, 1250, 1300 hertz, we're going to be hearing a really similar kind of pitch if they're uh, really different from that and they're down at 200, 220 hertz, we're going to be hearing a really different pitch than the 1200, 1250, 1300, and the 200, 220, 230, those are going to be similar in pitch. So again, what's similar out in the world, the physics, the physical stimulus, uh, we have a similarity in our perception. And this is different, clearly, right, as we're having really similar molecular structures, they don't smell anything alike, really different molecular structures have a have a similar odor sometimes. This is sometimes, but um, uh, very different than our other sensory systems. Okay, I'm going to end there as um, we are about to get into the neural code or how we are um, coding for uh, olfactory uh, information. And then we are going to talk about the brain regions that are involved as well and how um, those are uh, organized, what neurons are responding to. Uh, then we will talk about flavor and so the, the influence of olfaction on flavor, but also um, both how taste and, and olfaction and everything get put together for our experience of food. And then we'll move back into higher level visual processes. So we will move out of these other sensory systems and back to vision but into the more um some of the higher level um discussion of uh how we how we put that all together okay everybody have a nice weekend and take care stay safe i miss seeing you all very much uh so i hope you're all doing well <laughs>